World War II began brewing when Germany was seeking more power and began invading surrounding countries. German leader Adolf Hitler made alliances with Japan and Italy, and they were referred to as the Axis. The United States didn't want to have to go to war if they didn't need to, but on December 7, 1941, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor in Hawaii, and that pushed President Franklin D. Roosevelt to declare war on Japan, and then three days later, Hitler declared war on the United States. Once the United States went to war, the country jumped to the call. Men enlisted to fight and women went to work in factories to produce supplies and weapons. Americans learned to live their lives without the luxuries they were accustomed to so that anything extra could be used to support the war. Things like tires and gasoline were rationed, and even food like sugar and meat. Most of the fighting in World War II took place in Europe. Slowly, Germany invaded and took over France, Belgium, Poland, Norway, Denmark, and the Netherlands. And then Japan began invading China and islands in the Pacific Ocean. Great Britain fought hard to help protect these countries, but they needed more help. The United States formed an alliance with Great Britain, and both countries fought together. After years of fighting, the United States and Great Britain were ready to finally break Hitler's hold on Europe and end his tyranny. A giant invasion was planned with 2 million U.S. and British troops, 4,000 ships, and 11,000 aircraft. They landed on the beaches of Normandy, France. This was called D-Day. It took a few weeks, but eventually, the German forces that were occupying France were defeated. Through more battles and fighting, German forces and their allies were pushed back into Germany. Germany formally surrendered on May 8, 1945. The war in Europe was over. But what about the war with Japan in Asia? President Truman, who took office after President Roosevelt, had a difficult decision to make. Scientists had developed a powerful bomb that could kill tens of thousands of people and it would easily end the war with Japan. President Truman tried to end the war peacefully with Japan, but they wouldn't surrender. It was a hard choice, but President Truman ordered that atomic bombs be dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan. The bombs killed over 100,000 people and forced Japan to surrender. This ended World War II on September 2nd, 1945. A little short little video there, of course, from World War II. Just a little background, of course. Of course, we'll be talking about this week and next week. So anyway, of course, welcome you back to History 1123. It's Daniel Simon at Baton Rouge Community College. Hope you're having a great week out there, by the way. Uh, so yeah, anyway, um, so yeah, of course, of course, moving on, we'll be talking about, you know, World War II, uh, of course, also called the Second World War. Uh, and so uh, I'll be kind of uh, getting into like at least part one lecture today, kind of at least get into the like the outbreak of the war in 1939. And I'll probably get up to talking about at least uh, maybe the United States entering the war. We'll talk a lot about America uh, today, how we get, of course, into World War II. So anyway, I hope you're having a great week. Uh, of course, you know, we only have too many days left lecture-wise. I think I've got two lecture days next week. I know I've got planned uh, where we're, where we're going to wrap up World War II and, of course, talk about the Cold War era a little bit uh, as well. So, yeah, it's almost over the semester. Uh, so I hope you are kind of wrapping things up, uh, you know. And uh, I did want to remind you about some uh, assignments, of course, you've got out there uh, that you have got. Uh, there is, of course, a new assignment I did post the other day, which is on World War I. Uh, that, that, of course, assignment we do like late next week, on uh, the last week of classes. Uh, so that, that section will not be on the final exam. Uh, those that do have to take the final, of course, I think most of our final exam topics will cover from probably fascism, World War II, and whatever I can do on the Cold War era, of course, later next week. Uh, there is a final vocab, too, uh, that will be due at the end of the semester uh, as well. And I think there's one up still right now. I know I think it's due tomorrow, I believe, uh, which is that uh, Canvas quiz that was on the um, Industrial Revolution and Socialism. That's still up, I think, due uh, on Friday, April 23rd. So try to get that done. Uh, also, I do want to talk just briefly. Also, if anybody's doing the uh, Veterans Oral History Project, uh, that will be due May 1st. So I don't know if anybody's doing that or not. 
Uh, I did send, I'm kind of sending reminders out about that here and there about it. But if anybody's doing that assignment, uh, that'll be the due date for it pretty much. So anyway, it looks like we've got a few students watching right now. Savannah, hey, what's going on again this morning? Hope you're doing great out there. Hope, hey, what's up? Like your little smiley face there with the sun. Uh, uh, of course, hey, hey, what's up? Uh, Nina, of course, and David, of course, watching also as well. Uh, Edwina is also watching too as well. Hey, what's going on out there? Hope you're having a great morning uh, pretty much overall. So anyway, like I said, today we'll talk about, you know, uh, World War II, like at least part one, we'll kind of get get from like maybe 1939, I'm thinking to 1941. Uh, and then, of course, next week I'll kind of finish up World War II, 1942 to 45. Uh, so, yeah, I'm going to talk at least about, you know, how uh, Germany starts World War II in Europe. I'll get to that first, uh, talk about how that goes. Uh, of course, Germany's going to do a lot of mistakes, you know, like attack the Soviet Union. I'll kind of get into that, which really is one of the things that really leads into why Germany loses the war. Also, the aggression of Japan in, uh, in the Far East, in the Pacific, that, that, of course, gets the United States in the war also in 1941. Uh, if anybody has any comments, questions, of course, during the uh, live stream, let me know. Uh, of course, also, uh, you can also leave me any kind of comments, questions later about this lecture or, of course, any other lecture that I've got, of course, that we have in the past. So uh, anyway, um, uh, I think from last time we had talked about uh, how, uh, you know, Hitler was taking over Europe, you know, Nazi Germany. Uh, I think we discussed how he had already taken over, like he took back the Rhineland, I know, in 1936. Uh, then, of course, in 1938, I think it was March of 38, he uh, annexed Austria uh, into, um, he annexed Austria, I know that was one thing, into uh, what is um, uh, Germany. Uh, and then, uh, then he also, um, of course, we had the issue with the Sudetenland, if you remember correctly, uh, in Czechoslovakia, where the West, including Neville Chamberlain, gave him that. Uh, that was, of course, the issue of the policy of appeasement we kind of went into and talked about. And then, of course, by 1939, he was already taking over the eastern part of Czechoslovakia, which they made a kind of an independent state out of that, which was really pro-Nazi. Um, and I think we mentioned about that. Uh, and then, of course, he was already starting to plan, uh, you know, going into uh, what is Poland. Uh, he's already got this idea. And I didn't really talk about it from last time, which I did want to get into, but they had this thing called the uh, Molotov-Rippentrop Pact that became popular. Of course, they always talk about the beginning of World War II, uh, which happened in August of 1939. It was named for the two foreign ministers that met uh, between uh, the Soviet Union, Molotov and also Joachim von Rippentrop, who was the foreign minister of Nazi Germany. Uh, well, they all both met, if you know about this, uh, August of 1939. This became known as different names. I think the common name that they, they usually call it is the Non-Aggression Pact. Uh, you see, the Treaty of Non-Aggression between the Germany and, and the Soviet Union was the official, I guess, nickname. It's called all kinds of names. I think they usually dub it well, that. And the other name you see right above. And uh, the agreement did a bunch of things. Uh, one thing I know it did was it uh, created this 10-year uh, uh, non-aggression deal where neither side was supposed to fight war against each other. So the Soviets and the Germans wouldn't fight for 10 years, uh, from 1939 to 1949. Uh, and... Um, so, yeah, that's what they thought anyway. <laughs> of course, uh, you know, Hitler would renege on that, 1941. Uh, so, but, yeah, it was, a, it was. I'll get to why he did that, uh, of course, in a second. The, well, I had it right up there on the screen, uh, which is right here. I put it up. But basically the main reason why he did it was because the fact that he was really concerned that if he invaded Poland, 1939, he'd have to fight the Soviets in the East and then probably France and Britain in the West. And so it would prevent a two front war. So that was one of the main reasons he did it. Uh, also, if you look at this map here that I've got, uh, it also, they agreed to divide up Poland 
between the two countries. So uh, Germany would get the western part of Poland, and then the, the Soviets would get the eastern part of Poland <clears throat> with that line that would be, I guess, about right there uh, as well. Uh, they also agreed to give the Soviets control of the Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, uh, which the you know the Soviets would annex uh, into uh, their country. It's kind of sad what happened with that, but they went in there and they I think they forced a lot of those people in the Baltic states. They took them and they forced them eastward in like Siberia or whatever. Uh, got rid of a lot of them <clears throat> and. Um, so yeah, that, that's what what the plan was, uh, pretty much with that, and so that that would enable Hitler to really, you know, be able to easily, you know, walk into Poland and take it, you know, at that point. Uh, they did have an invasion plan they had, which was called, by the way, Fall Vice, which is Case White, of course, was the code name uh, for the actual invasion plans of Poland. And uh, what, what, what the Germans did, by the way, was they invaded from three locations, from uh, greater Germany, you can see in that map. Uh, they also invaded from uh, Czechoslovakia and also from East Prussia. So they actually had three different locations they could actually invade from. So over here, over here, and then also in Czechoslovakia over here uh, as well. Uh, and so Poland, Poland really didn't have a chance. Their military wasn't really that good anyway uh, compared to what the Germans had uh, overall. And so what happened was on September 1st, 1939, uh, the Germans invaded Poland, uh, you know, sparking basically the Second World War. World War II breaks out, of course, because of that. World War II, by the way, is going to last six years, you can see, from 1939 uh, to 1945 uh, with probably causing at one point 60 million dead. If you count, you know, all the people that died in Europe, uh, people that died in the Pacific, Asia, uh, et cetera, North Africa. Uh, so it, it's basically a conflict that'll, you know, envelop the wor world pretty much over a long period of time. Uh, now, because the fact that the Germans invade Poland, France and Britain uh, decided that they were going to back Poland this time because you know they kind of blew off Czechoslovakia. You know what they did with them. The Czechoslovakians felt like they had been betrayed. By the way, uh, when the, you know that whole thing at Munich back in 1938. Uh, so France and Britain declared war two days later. I think it's September 3rd you know, is the date. He didn't think they would. I think he was thought that they would be like you know Czechoslovakia. What happened with that? Uh, they just walk in and take it uh, and all that. But Basically, that's that's what happens uh, with that point. And so now you've got these two sides fighting at that point. Although at first, it's actually Germany versus Britain, France. Uh, Soviet Union stays neutral. Italy does not get in the war really until the Germans invade the West. When they attack France, will get in the war. Uh, but later, you'll have these different sides. You know, you've got the Axis powers I told you about, the main ones, which are Germany, Italy, and Japan later. Uh, they have uh, that will fight against France, Britain, Soviet Union, United States, China. Those are really your main allies that really fight, uh, of course, the Axis powers in Europe. Although France kind of drops out. If you know about that, they're only in the war 1939, 1940. They actually get defeated by the Germans and are forced out. I think they come back later after the Allies invade France and free them. Uh, but they're kind of knocked out of the war later. Uh, here is all the Axis powers total, by the way, not, not just the ones, the three main ones I talked about, but Germany, Italy, Japan uh, later formed this alliance as part of the so-called tripartite pact, uh, which kind of was an extension of the Rome-Berlin axis uh, that Germany and Italy formed in 1936. Uh, but you can see other countries at one point were in it. Romania, Hungary, Bulgaria, Slovakia, that little country that was part of Czechoslovakia, where Prague is, uh, was kind of included in it. Uh, Vichy, the Vichy, Vichy French or Vichy France, I'll talk about them later. That's a pro-Nazi state uh, that the Germans set up in France after they defeated them. Uh, and uh, so those are kind of the opposing sides that they have, of course, uh, in World War II uh, later. Uh, Poland, like I said, did not have a chance. You know, the 
polls, you know, get invaded uh, pretty easily. Uh, and and um, I think it's like lasted, I want to say four weeks was about how long it took for the Germans uh, to take Poland and to seize like their capital, which is Warsaw. Uh, and um, if you know much about the war, the Germans used this new form of warfare you may have heard of called Blitzkrieg, uh, which, um, which you know, if you know, it means you can see there, it means lightning war. It was a new type of German tactic where uh, they used a combination of like mobilized forces, uh, like tanks, trucks, air power, things like that. Uh, and they still used horses, believe it or not. In World War II, there's actually even some case where they use it still having actually horse cavalry. <laughs> I think it was one of the last wars where they actually have horse cavalry. Believe it or not, I think even the Poles had horse cavalry, which wasn't too good against tanks. You know about that. Uh, but basically, they get overwhelmed in a matter of a few weeks, and uh, it's devastating. You know, bombs out of their cities. I think Warsaw was practically almost destroyed uh, when when the Germans basically uh, took the city. Uh, and uh, the media, the media called it that. They called it Blitzkrieg, basically. Uh, and so, yeah, yeah, Poland fell. Uh, the Soviets came in from the east, mopped up also as well. Uh, and so, uh, Poland, Poland was pretty much wiped off the map and is occupied by pretty much both powers in the war, Germans and Soviets. Although, Germany will take over all of Poland when they invade the Soviet Union, uh, which will occupy, I think, up to like 1944. So, and of course, I think all the Jews in Poland, you know, they get caught up in that whole Holocaust thing. So the Germans send in uh, commandos in there, like those uh, Eitz and Gruppen, I think they talk, talk about later, that start, you know, rounding up Jews and killing them uh, in, in basically uh, in, in Poland and all that, and also in Russia later as well. Now, what happened after Poland fell? Uh, they, they have this period afterwards that they sometimes, they call it the phony war, which it's spelled different ways. I think in the, the British spell it phony, P-H-O-N-E-Y. And we spell it without the E, you know about that. But uh, they had this uh, phony war, they call it, that happened between 1939 and 1940, where it was kind of like a lull in the war, uh, where basically neither side were really doing much uh, fighting. And... Um, but Hitler, of course, in the meanwhile, was starting to plan. You know, he was planning his attack on the West. Uh, and I think the common things they talk about that happened in the phony war that occurred was that, you know, besides Hitler planning the invasion of the West, I think the reason why he postponed it was because he wanted to wait, I think, until after the winter. And he also thought maybe the allies like Britain and France would capitulate, like especially Britain would kind of drop out of the war or something like that. He really thought the British really wanted to fight the war. Germans. Uh, but he also invaded Denmark above Germany, took over that. Uh, and then if you know what happened, I think by April of 1940, he crossed the uh, Baltic Sea and they seized Norway. They took over Norway. Uh, and they wanted Norway because it was next to Sweden. Uh, and um, Sweden has a lot of natural resources like iron ore, magnesium, etc. Uh, so they, they wanted things like that uh, for their war machine also to control like the Baltic and the North Sea because they were thinking they might have to attack the, attack the, you know, the British, uh, like attack them and air bomb them or whatever, of course, in the war, which they will. So I think for a while, Norway had this um, dictator that controlled it named Victor Quisling. You may have heard the name. Uh, and uh, he was this pro-Nazi Norwegian guy uh, that kind of was in power for a bunch of years for the Nazis. And the word Quisling now means traitor. In, in, in Norway <laughs> because of that. Uh, now, but Hitler was planning. He was planning to, you know, attack the West. That's some, you know, I guess the Europe, British and French didn't think maybe he was going to invade, uh, but it was called Fall Gale. They call it Case Yellow, uh, which was the invasion of Western Europe, uh, which would be like eventually uh, into uh, the Netherlands, the Belgium, Luxembourg, uh, France, all that would eventually fall. Uh, and it was all part of this invasion plan that was developed by Eric von Manstein. Manstein was considered, by the way, one of the greatest German generals in World War II. It really was. Uh, he had the so-called Manstein plan, which Hitler tried to take credit for it, by the way, which wasn't is actually not his idea. It was actually uh, this other general named Heinz Guderian, who, by the way, was the 
so-called father of the panzer attack using tanks uh, in Germany, he came up with this idea where they, they ought to attack the, through the Ardennes forest. Uh, and um, you know about the French, between World War I and World War II, the French developed this uh, military defense line called the Maginot Line that they had, which was on their eastern border with the Germans. Uh, and they thought that's what World War I would be. Uh, but if, if you know about World War II, it was more mobilized. Uh, and so the Germans just went around it. Uh, that defense line, the Maginot line, and it was really useless in the war. Uh, and so they realized that they could attack through the Ardennes, uh, they could really break through, and that would be the end of the, you know, the allies in the West. Uh, so uh, the plan was to basically put like something like 80% of their panzer divisions, like their tank forces, mobilized forces, uh, through there. And that's what happened in the spring of... Um, 19, 1940, uh, the Germans uh, invaded through where Sudan is. Uh, this is kind of like what happened in the Franco-Prussian War. Here's kind of a map showing you here, but you can see Guderian was one who led the forces, by the way. The guy really came up with the actual plan uh, that, that you know, aided Manstein uh, and all that. Uh, and so, yeah, they break through there, uh, the Allied lines, uh, with, you know, K Case Yellow right there. And so what ends up happening is the um, Germans break through. This is a matter of like four or five days uh, between May May 10th and May 14th. You can see the critical days right there. But from May 10th to May 20th, they basically break through and they race all the way uh, to the English Channel. Uh, and uh, I think there was a case where the um, French tried to counterattack uh, with this, um, I think it was called, I think I've got a map showing it right here. They have this thing called um, Wagen's Plan. I think Wagen was this French general they brought in, well, I think was in the Far East at the time. He brought in this idea where the BEF, which was up here uh, in northern France, and the French army would kind of attack and meet each other to cut off the advance of the German forces, but it failed. They couldn't meet. Uh, and so you can see here that the that the Germans basically raced up the coast to where Calais is, uh, right below Dunkirk on the English Channel. And what ends up happening uh, to the uh, French, the French, French and British forces, they get cut in half. Uh, and then they have this uh, so-called, uh, I don't have a good map up to show you, but you can kind of see here the so-called Dunkirk pocket. That's an old map. Dunkirk pocket, so-called forms. Uh, out of that whole thing. So get this case where a lot of the British and some of the French are surrounded uh, in this huge pocket, <clears throat> that's right, which eventually shrinks between May and June uh, right there. And the British at that point realize that they got to get out or they're going to lose all their forces, which is like, you know, several hundred thousand troops or more uh, they've had in, in France. And so this leads to a famous operation you may have heard about which was called Op Operation Dynamo. Uh, it was dubbed. Uh, of course, the British later called it the Miracle of Dunkirk, uh, you know, because they were able to get, get people out. And so uh, live was just because of the German blitzkrieg. They just they caught them with their pants down, you know, and they were surprised. And so um, with the Germans invading France at that point, their only escape route is the sea, you know, via the English Channel. So you can see there they evacuate, you know, over 300,000 troops between May 27th uh, to about June 4th, 1940. So it's a matter of like, you know, a little over a week uh, that they do this. And uh, it's very famous for the fact that the British had to bring in all kinds of ships, not just like, you know, destroyers or other kind of ships that the, the, the British Navy had, but uh, any kind of yacht or, or kind of steamboat or ship, I guess they had. <laughs> that was running, you know, they brought it in uh, to evacuate people that were trapped. And so that's that's why they called it later the so-called miracle of Dunkirk because they were able to evacuate all these people out, but they lost all their equipment. That's one thing that's, you know, real famous about Dunkirk. Uh, and uh, you can see all the men that are kind of lined up on the beaches, really trying to get out. And some of them even had to wade out in the water to get to get on the ships that were that were waiting. 
a couple of years ago, they made a really good movie about that called Dunkirk. I don't know if you ever seen it, but it's kind of shows you how difficult it was to, for, for these soldiers to get out, you know? So I think those that didn't get out were basically uh, were seized as POWs. And you can imagine that some of these men were POWs through the whole war <laughs> up to 1945, that ones that got caught right there. Of course they couldn't get out. So, so anyway, but it's, you know, they, they were able to fight, fight later. That's, that's the thing about what happened with that. All these British soldiers that got out on some French were able to fight later, you know, against the, against the Axis powers. And some of them will be later used, you know, to fight the war, like in North Africa, Italy, and probably later in France as well. Now, of course, they call this whole thing, and there's, of course, different nicknames, by the way, they call this whole thing the, uh, you know, the invasion of um, France that's kind of going on right now. But uh, they usually refer to it as the um, so-called, well, they call it the Battle of France, but I think a lot of people call it the so-called Fall of France because France fell, like, really quick, within, like, six weeks. Uh, after Dunkirk, it was just, like, a matter of like, I think two weeks after that, uh, that the Germans just marched right into Paris and they basically took it. Uh, and you can see here, Hitler actually came to Paris. It's the only time he ever visited Paris, by the way, in the war. He visited there, he visited all the sites. He like, you know, most tourists do. Went to see the Eiffel Tower, uh, went to go see the tomb of Napoleon, uh, et cetera. Uh, when he's there, so he's right there at the top, top right there, Hitler in white. Uh, and, um, and of course the Germans, the Germans, you know, uh, surrender, uh, within a few days later, June 22nd, 1940, uh, they actually sign another agreement, uh, to end that conflict between each other, the same forest of Com Compiègne, uh, that was signed in World War One. They actually pulled out the old railway car, uh, where they had, you know, previously ended World War One on November 11th, 1918. And so Hitler basically made him eat crow. Uh, that's what he did uh, in World War II. Uh, and uh, what were the surrender terms for Germany with the French uh, after the war? Well, I'll kind of show you, um, here's another picture of Hitler, by the way, with Eiffel Tower in the background, of course, right there. But basically, um, surrender terms kind of went like this. They divided up France in half, you can see that the, they had a northern zone, which is what they call occupied France, uh, as they called it right there. And occupied France had Paris as its capital. It's kind of like an open city uh, during the war. And then the southern zone was unoccupied. It became actually the southern part of France became this pro French pro Nazi state uh, that was called Vichy France because it was its capital was at Vichy was in the southern part of France. And um, it was held by, it was led by this guy, uh, you may have heard before, named Pétain. Uh, Pétain, we talked about before, the Lion of Verdun. Of course, hero in World War I, uh, Philippe Henry Pétain. Uh, and he, of course, led that state pretty much during the war. And uh, they part of why they did this was because of the fact that they, they were concerned that the um, uh, French had colonies like, you know, in North Africa, Southeast Asia and all that. And they thought they would, you know, would rebel. They also uh, were hoping to, to use the, the um, French Navy that they had, the Germans. And I think they ended up sinking or something, the British or something like that. But, um, but that, that's pretty much, you know, what happened with the French. They were pretty much occupied, uh, you know, after the war. Uh, Germany even ex annexed, you can see in that map, some territories. Like it, it annexed the eastern part of France where Alsace-Lorraine is and all that. So that was all taken uh, by the Germans also after the war. Uh, de Gaulle, he was a famous general. Charles de Gaulle was this general that had fought in the war, and he fled the country uh, afterwards. A lot of the other French kind of stayed around and just kind of were occupied by the Germans in the war. But... Uh, the, the, he, he decided to leave the country and flee to Britain, uh, where he set up a, a, an exile government of the French, which became known as the Free France, uh, as they called it, Free France Movement, uh, to get back France, you know, from the Germans. And uh, they had military forces that were called the Free French. 
uh, that fought alongside with the Allies, you know, during the war. And de Gaulle, of course, headed him up uh, and all that. And de Gaulle was kind of important with the free French government uh, because uh, they were involved in, you know, the French resistance movement to try to, you know, uh, see if they could harm the, the, the German cause in the war in France and also support like down airmen, <clears throat> any air, kind of airmen that I guess fell, they would help, you know, get them out and things like that. So um, <clears throat> that's kind of what happened with the French. The French are pretty much, you know, like I said, knocked out of the war <clears throat> at that point, 1940. <clears throat> but when the Allies do invade 1944, they kind of rejoin them. That's what they'll do later. Now, of course, <clears throat> with the French, <clears throat> with the French out of the war, the French out of the war, of course, uh, what happens next is the um, British, the British, of course, um, of course, are the only ones left fighting the war. From 1940 to really 1941, uh, the British fight alone uh, in uh, what they call the darkest hour. I think it's one of the terms that Winston Churchill kind of talks about it. And Churchill, of course, as you know, became prime minister, by the way, when the Battle of France started. I think May 10th, 1940, he comes in. And uh, as you know, Churchill was very famous during the war uh, for a lot of his great speeches. I think one of his best ones, of course, was the Never Surrender speech uh, that he gave, where they said that they would basically fight anywhere, fight on the beaches and all that, landing grounds and all that. And um, so he's really considered to be one of Britain's greatest politicians probably ever in their history. Uh, and... Um, so, yeah, he's prime minister from 1940 uh, to 45. And uh, following the debacle of France, you've got the Battle of Britain. That's the big thing, of course, that comes in after uh, in the war and more into the fall of 1940, uh, when, of course, the British would have to hold off the Germans, who Germans were planning to basically invade, uh, was their next thing that they were going to try to do. Uh, and... Um, if you know much about the Battle of Britain, the Battle of Britain was an air was pretty much an air air battle. Uh, that's one thing it's kind of known known for. And uh, you have pretty much these two opposing air forces that fight each other. You've got the RAF, which of course the British Air Force, uh, and then you had the German Air Force, which of course was called the Luftwaffe. And supposedly at the time, the German Luftwaffe was more powerful. And, of course, it was headed up by, you know, Herman Goering, uh, who was a famous World War I ace. <clears throat> and um, the, German, the Germans were planning to try to invade. Uh, I don't know if you know much about this, but they had this thing called Operation Sea Lion that they had, or Sea Low, I think is the German uh, code name for it. And it was this idea, <clears throat> the idea where they were going to do an amphibious um, invasion using, like, uh, barges and other uh, German ships. Uh, to try to cross the uh, English Channel uh, in invade, uh, they began training for it. I mean, Germans were kind of starting to kind of train for this actual invasion, but they're not sure how serious they were about it. I think uh, I think a lot of the Germans, uh, military, you know, top you know, generals and all that, were kind of skeptical about whether they could really do this or not. <clears throat> and um, anyway. Um, However, the problem was the, the Germans were unable to really, uh, you know, destroy the RAF. That was the only problem. They couldn't, for some reason during the war, they weren't able to prevent, you know, the manufacturing of planes and things like that. Uh, and so over time, Hitler would have to postpone it, sea line, like indefinitely. Uh, and um, in the Battle of Britain, the RAF had a bigger advantage. Uh, they were fighting over, you know, Britain or over the channel. That was, that was a big advantage uh, for them. Uh, they also had the use of radar, uh, which is something new that was coming in, uh, where they could detect enemy planes coming in. Uh, and so they, what, what what British Fighter Command did, you know, was that they basically, um, for the RAF, uh, they would actually divide the radar into sectors. Uh, so if certain, you know, sectors had a plane coming in, they would send up, you know, planes to attack them. Uh, so that, that was a big advantage 
Uh, in uh, early on in the conflict, when it got started, like July, August, 1940, the Germans tried to attack at first, you know, military targets. That's what they started out as. But if you know how the, how the thing kind of went with the war, uh, the Germans started bombing like London. They started bombing like British cities. It's kind of like a terror tactic uh, to hopefully get the, the British to kind of surrender in, or, or at least you know, capitulate the war uh, with the Germans. Uh, and um, and so that led to a lot of civilian bombings. That's, that's one thing that's very famous about uh, the Battle of Britain and other battles that will be later uh, in the war. Of course, you know, the Allies will do a massive aerial bombardment of Germany during the war. They did that in Japan uh, as well. And it led to a lot of um, civilians being killed in the war. That's part of why World War II had so many people die. Um, now, from 1940 to 41, the Germans would bomb Britain, like London, other cities, which you can see would lead to like 40 to 50,000 British people being killed, mostly civilians. And it was known as the Blitz. That was one of the nicknames uh, they often called it. And it would end up killing like something like that many people. And you can see the amount of buildings that were destroyed as well. Some like 2 million buildings or houses were actually destroyed or damaged at one point in the war. The Germans kept doing it later when, when Hitler had those so-called V or vengeance uh, weapons like the V1 and V2. Uh, they would keep bombing them pretty much throughout the war. So uh, the Germans were hoping to kind of demoralize the British, you know, to basically get them to surrender or to damage their war economy in the war, but it didn't really hurt them like it they thought it would. Although rationing was kind of a problem, I know, uh, in the war, but the Lend-Lease Act later, which the United States kind of created you know, during the war, kind of helped a lot of these allied powers fight the Axis powers uh, overall. Uh, losses, by the way, for the Germans were pretty bad. They lost over 2,500 aircraft. I think over 2,500 to 3,000 like airmen were killed on the Ger on German side. They lost a lot of men, of course, in that battle. And uh, Hitler later gave up by 1941 trying to defeat the British. And as you know, they turned their other direction eastward to fight the Soviets. It's one of the things, of course, uh, that eventually happened. So that's something that, that we'll get more to, um, you know, get into next, which is the Soviet Union. But you can see with the Blitz, at one point, they bombed London 57 nights in a row. They did a lot of night bombing, which is kind of more difficult, you know, to do. They had to actually go down the, the, to the subways, the tube, you know, in London, really to get away from some of the bombings and some of the things that they did. They used a lot of incendiary bombs, which a lot of the Allies would use later, too, also in World War II. All right, yeah, we need to get into next, of course, because, you know, one of the things that, of course, Hitler does next, as you know, uh, is he declares war on Russia. That's the big thing, of course, uh, that happens. You can see a newspaper uh, article there from the Boston Herald in the United States. They la launched this massive invasion of the Soviet Union, uh, which was, by the way, codenamed Operation Barbarossa, which was, by the way, named after, one I think, some kind of um, famous um, Holy Roman Empire king named, um, I think, Frederick Barbarossa, I think his name was. And anyway, it was one of the largest invasions, by the way, uh, in history, like something like three to four million uh, troops were amassed by the Germans on the Eastern Front. The Soviets didn't think it would happen. Stalin thought that, you know, Hitler was his friend, <laughs> you know, because of the that that non-aggression pact they'd signed in, in 1939. Uh, but I think Hitler thought that eventually they would have to go to war with the Soviets because the Soviets were getting more powerful uh, and all that. And so um, the invasion... Um, of course, would be one of the bloodiest uh, in in really uh, in history. Uh, like the Eastern Front, as you know, was the bloodiest front uh, in World War II. Something like 30 million people were killed on the Eastern Front. This is a combination of like German, Soviet troops that were killed in the war, along with also all the civilians. Uh, of course, the, 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 the Russians today call it the Great Patriotic War because uh, they kind of compared it to when Napoleon invaded 1812. I think in 1812, they called the Patriotic War 
when Napoleon invaded in 1812. So they call this one the Great Patriotic War, kind of an extension of that name. Uh, and um, yeah, 30 million people. This to give you an idea of how bad it was, the Soviets supposedly lost like 10 million soldiers that died in the war, which is by the way equivalent to the amount of men that we put up in World War II, the United States. I think the United States had 10 million men that served in the war. They had 10 million that died. <laughs> That's crazy. You think about that. And I think the Germans lost like seven or eight million, I think, also in the war as well, just to kind of give me a comparison. Uh, so, so really bad. Uh, and a lot of winter fighting, too, which made it kind of difficult sometimes uh, as well. But, yeah, early on, it did not go well at all. If you look at this map here, the Germans uh, would invade uh, and easily strike deeply uh, into uh, Nazi Germany excuse me, from Nazi Germany into uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, and um, they overrun like Eastern Poland is taken, uh, the Baltic states is taken, Belarus. Uh, they overrun the Ukraine, uh, you know, where Kiev is uh, as well. And uh, Stalin's armies lose like three, four million men just in the first couple of bumps. I think the Germans end up capturing like at one point in the Eastern Front, three to four million uh troops, which a lot of them actually starved to death. Well, the Germans didn't have food to feed them. A lot of them died in, pri uh, in prison camps uh, and all that. Uh, and, uh, and so that, that brought in the Soviet Union uh, into uh, the Allied camp uh, when, when this happened. And you can see, why, why did, why did uh, Hitler want to invade the Soviet Union? There's a lot of different reasons for that, but obviously a lot of it was natural resources. You know, the fact that the Germans were kind of blockaded in the West, you know, by the Allies. Uh, so they wanted, you know, minerals, oil, oil, and oil was a big thing, uh, was what they wanted the most. Uh, of course, Hitler had wanted that Lebensraum I talked about in Mein Kampf, uh, where he wanted living space for the Germans and he wanted to colonize the East. Uh, I think he also wanted to, all the Jews that were in the East, he wanted to kill all of them off, which is what he would, of course, try to do uh, with the, Holocaust uh, and all that, and um, the uh, one of the things that happened, uh, if you know about it, was uh, he wasn't able to take Moscow. He almost took Leningrad, though, which is Saint Petersburg, uh, where they laid siege to it. Which is interesting about this, uh, the siege of Leningrad, which would last, by the way, like over over two years. I think it lasts like eight hundred days. It's one of the longest sieges, by the way, uh, in modern times. And uh, Leningrad, I think, at one point had like uh, something like a million uh, Soviet citizens actually starve to death because they couldn't get food. Uh, and there were cases where uh, the uh, Soviet, some of the citizens actually uh, relied on cannibalism. They started eating each other because they didn't have enough food and all that. Uh, so it'd be a long time before they would free it. And Germans basically bombed the crud out of St. Petersburg, just bombed it, bombed it a lot in the war. But uh, by the winter of 1941, uh, the uh, Soviets, um, they, they failed to get Moscow. Uh, the Soviets actually counterattacked them in the winter. And uh, part of it was because of the fact that the um, Germans hadn't really mopped up all of the Ukraine. They had trouble trying to take Kiev for some reason. Uh, and so um, that kind of postponed it. And, and Stalin had troops in the Far East that he brought to reinforce his forces uh, in front of Moscow, and he was able to stall them. So that was kind of important. I think if Hitler would have taken Moscow, that might have been you know, a turning point maybe uh, in the war. But the Eastern Front ends up, if you know about it, being the whole turning point front in World War II. I know people in the West don't talk about it as much. Because the United States, we always talk about D-Day and the Pacific War and all that, I know. Uh, but pretty much the reason why Germany lost the war was because the, the invasion of the Soviet Union, Barbarossa, it failed. The op actual operation failed. And uh, you have to understand that Barbarossa was an operation that was only supposed to take place over a few months. That's it. They would defeat the Soviets and that would be it, like a short war. Uh, and, of course, it ended up being a protracted war uh, that would end up lasting almost four years. So it wasn't supposed to be planned that way, uh, you know. And so that that's 
eventually the Soviets are going to counterattack and push them back and eventually get, of course, invaded uh, by the Soviets from the east. That's going to end up, of course, being, you know, why that happens. All right. I want to move on today. And, of course, I'm also going to talk about next as well. We need to get into and discuss the fact that eventually the United States gets in, in the war, you know, because of uh, Japan. You've got, of course, the attack on Pearl Harbor uh, that you can see. There's the Arizona burning, of course, right there uh, that we have. Uh, and uh, anyway, um, one, of, one of the things that caused us to get in the war, as you know, is the Japanese attack us uh, in 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 December of 1941, it's a, of course a major turning point. The United States entering, you know, World War II, because uh, you know our not just our troops, but our industry, our war, indus war industries, you know, helped turn the war around. You know, Lend Lease Act and all that uh, that, that we had in this this country as a whole. But uh, yeah, the Japanese, you know, would attack us on December 7th, 1941, and so that that gets us into, of course, the war at this point. And um, a lot of it was because of the rise of the Japanese empire. The empire of Japan was expanding in Asia and in the Pacific, uh, primarily between the wars. Uh, a lot of it uh, was due for different reasons. Um, if you study about Japan, uh, Japan uh, was this kind of country uh, that lacked natural resources. Uh, and so uh, and also because of the fact that a Great Depression happened as well, that, that kind of hurt their economy, you know, between the wars, uh, like, like Germany had. And, uh, but you had like a rise in fascism, a rise in militarism, a rise of extreme nationalism uh, in Japan under uh, their emperor Hirohito. Uh, and uh, so Japan, you know, all of a sudden finds itself really aligned with like Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. Uh, so this happens by pretty much the late 1930s because everybody else is against them. And um, Japan later joins that, you know, that, that, I told you about that tripartite pact, right, in 1940. They eventually join with Germany and Italy, uh, you know. Uh, and so um, and Japan had this idea, uh, if you know about the Japanese, uh, they wanted to try to take over Asia. They thought that maybe they could create their own imperial empire uh, like all these other powers in the world, like Germany, uh, Britain, and France. Uh, and so uh, the Germans had this idea that they ought to have an Asia for Asians, uh, which they call later the so-called, um, put it on the screen, but it was called the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. Uh, and this Japan Japanese empire sphere uh, was this idea to basically kick out all the uh, imperial powers, Europeans, America, whoever else, uh, in Asia and the Pacific. Uh, but the Japanese were kind of racist. They thought that the Japanese were better than other Asians. That's something they believed uh, heavily. And so they took advantage of that because you have all these weaker powers, you know, throughout Asia and they would kind of take over. And uh, if you look at this map here, uh, to give you an idea, uh, the Japanese at one point would basically control a vast amount of territory. So they would take over Korea, they had Korea early on, Taiwan. Uh, they would try to take over China, like Manchuria first was taken over. Burma, Thailand, Indochina, where Vietnam is later. Malaysia, uh, the Dutch East Indies, which is like Indonesia later. New Guinea, the Philippines. Uh, and you can see also parts of the, uh, we parts of the uh, Western Pacific. Uh, they would also take over eventually. So mass amounts of territory. Most of these would be taken by 1942, uh, a massive empire. So people think of Germany conquering Europe and all that uh, at the time, but you know the Japanese conquered a lot of territory too, uh, as this empire later up to World War II. Uh, now, one of the big things that uh, Japan, you know, would start doing first, uh, if you know about, it, like if you look at that map right there, uh, you can see they first went into uh, what is. Uh, Manchuria, like in 1931, uh, the Japanese went in there and took it over, which was part of China at the time. It's kind of between China and the Soviet Union. Uh, and uh, they called it later Manchukuo, which was this Japanese puppet state. And uh, why did the uh, Japanese want control of Manchuria? Well, they wanted it because of natural resources. It's a massive area, by the way, 
that's about the size of like California, Oregon, Washington. It's a huge area. Uh, so Republic of China was kind of like um, like a really a weak state. Uh, and so they're able to kind of get that there. It's kind of like you can see it's kind of an area between kind of China and Soviet Union. And so they take it over. Uh, and so that's initially how they get into taking over part of China. And you can see it's right above Korea. That's where it is. Uh, however, that was not enough. Uh, the Japanese then eventually sparked the so-called uh, China, uh, the so-called second uh, Japan, the second Sino-Japanese War, uh, which of course followed 1937 then 1945. You know, one of the longest conflicts uh, that they have in World War II. It was actually pretty bloody too. I think an estimated 10 million Chinese may have died uh, in the war. Uh, and so um, that helps to escalate conflicts in Asia. But some people think that the Second Sino-Japanese War was one of the conflicts that really caused World War II later uh, to occur. It actually started in July of 1937 with this incident called the Marco Polo Bridge Incident, uh, where the um, Republic of China's army fought the Imperial Japanese army. And next thing you know, uh, what ends up happening is the war escalates. Uh, and Japan decides, hey, we're going to invade uh, the eastern part of China too. And so China actually starts conquering parts of eastern China. Uh, they seize a lot of their major cities. Nan Nanjing, also called Nanking, which was actually the capital of China at the time. Peking or Beijing was seized. Shanghai was taken. So was Hong Kong, also on the southern coast of China, uh, was also seized. So a lot of the important ports, I think, were taken mostly on the eastern part. And uh, the Japanese were known for committing uh, atrocities, like the rape the rape of Nanking, you may have heard about, or the Nanking Massacre uh, was something that was very famous uh, that happened at the beginning of the Sino-Japanese War. Uh, where uh, Japanese forces uh, had an episode of mass murder, mass rape uh, that was committed against uh, men and women uh, in, in what is uh, Nanking, uh, a lot of the civilians. Uh, and they're not sure the number of people that were murdered, but anywhere from 40,000 to 300,000 has been estimated uh, that may have been killed uh, in the actual uh, rape, rape of Nanking. And uh, they also, if you know about this, the Japanese forced a lot of uh, Chinese women and other Asian, other non-Japanese Asian women uh, into what is prostitution. They use them as what they call comfort women, if you know about this, that they're known for. So the Japanese were known for all these different atrocities. Uh, they also took, you know, POWs and those that sometimes, you know, if they surrendered, they would execute them and things like that, uh, that they were kind of notorious for. So Japanese did not like soldiers that, that surrendered. Uh, they thought that was cowardly uh, because the Japanese had this thing called the Code of Bushido, uh, where they believed that soldiers ought to fight to the death, uh, you know, for their emperor, etc. Uh, the U.S., by the way, um, we felt threatened, you know, by the Japanese, you know, going into China uh, in, in parts of, you know, Southeast Asia and all that. And so, uh, what happens, of course, as you know, is the U.S. begins su supporting the Chinese, the Republic of China uh, at first, which the leader of China was Chiang Kai-shek uh, at the time. He was there. He was like a general and politician. And so we start we start flying aid to them at first. I think uh, if you know about this in what is um, Thai, uh, in, in India, actually we start flying missions over the Himalayas. They call it the hump. I think is what they called it. Uh, and we start bringing in. Um, like, you know, military aid uh, to help them out uh, because the Japanese had blocked the Burma Road. Uh, they went from Burma into, I guess, into India. Uh, and so uh, British U.S. actually flew missions uh, where they flew over the hump. I'll put it on the screen there, uh, right there, uh, flying over the Himalayas. Uh, so that was the beginning of the so-called China-Burma-India theater that was being fought throughout that in the Far East that they sometimes called it. And it later would involve the so-called flying tigers they had. We brought them in too, uh, which were Americans that volunteered uh, to fight with the Chinese Air Force, uh, which they did for 
first couple of years there. Uh, and uh, they were known later as the, um, they were later called the um, American Volunteer Group, is usually what they called it. And they were led by uh, Claire Chennault, who was, by the way, from Texas. Uh, he was a general that actually at one point went to LSU, he attended Louisiana State University in uh, 1909, 1910. And he was the commanding uh, officer of it. Uh, and um, anyway, uh, part of why they were brought in, the, the Flying Tigers, was because of the fact that the Chinese Air Force was not that good. Uh, and so they formed, like, I think three wings of the Chinese Air Force uh, they had. They were known for flying these uh, airplanes that were called the P-40 Warhawk, which you may have heard of. We're also called sometimes the Tomahawk as well, which uh, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, they have one actually hanging up in the uh, where the USS Kidd is, a uh, famous destroyer that was, of course, that, uh, of course, was involved in the Pacific War against the Japanese. Uh, so that's the typical kind of planes they were known for. They were, they were famous for putting, like, these, um, I guess it was like tiger's teeth or shark's teeth on the front of them. That was well known. Uh, they had famous aces that were big. I think the two most famous aces they had was, like, uh, Tex Hill, who had, like, I think 10, 10 uh, kills in the war. You may have heard of Pappy Boeington. Pappy Boeington was a famous uh World War II ace uh, who fought with the Flying Tigers. And later he had this outfit called the um, Black Sheep Squadron, which was a Marine outfit uh, that fought the Japanese in the war. He had 26 kills in the war, which is pretty good, uh, but it's not the most ever you know, in the war. But anyway, but that's basically how, you know, we start kind of getting in the war at that point. Uh, and then, of course, the thing that would really get us in the war, as you know, huh, is, of course, Pearl Harbor. That's the thing, of course, we'll talk about today, you know, is the fact that the Japanese uh, eventually attacked us uh, at Pearl Harbor. And uh, this was actually caused by the fact that in the summer of 1941, uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt, the President of the United States, decided that they needed to do something to stop the Japanese, like in Asia. And so they put an embargo on the Japanese. Uh, like banning certain shipments of like oil, you can see fuel, steel, uh, scrap metal, uh, and uh, those kind of things basically uh, hurt the Japanese war machine, you know, in Asia Pacific, etc. And so they believed that uh, the Japanese responded, you know, by attacking the United States is what they did. They retaliated against us. And what they did, of course, as you know, is they attacked Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941, uh, which was planned by the Imperial Japanese Navy. You can see that was Yam Admiral Yamamoto. He was one of the, the top uh, admirals in the uh, Japanese Navy. And um, they, attacked the, uh, they attacked Pearl Harbor, which is in Oahu, Hawaii, uh, because of the fact that that was where our Pacific fleet was. The United States had its main fleet there, base there, right there. And um, they thought that if we, they could attack and eliminate our fleet, uh, that that basically would lead to us maybe suing for peace you know, in, a, in a short war you know, between the United States and Japan. And so uh, what happened was the Japanese amassed a huge fleet uh, to attack uh, our, our, our fleet, of course, in Hawaii. And uh, they actually got the idea from the, um, there was a battle called, I'll put it back on the screen, called the Battle of Toronto. that happened in uh, November of 1940, where the British attacked, uh, I think, the Italian Navy in the southern part of Italy. Uh, and so it got the idea of the Japanese that they could do the same thing. So I think the British used torpedo bombers. So Japan figured they could use torpedo bombers uh, to do this mostly to go after our fleet. And so what happened was the Japanese amassed a huge uh, carrier task force, uh, which was called the First Air Fleet. And uh, you can see there on the bottom there, those are the six aircraft carriers that were involved, of course, uh, in that task force. Akagi, Akaga, Soryu, Hiryu, Shikaku, Zukaku, uh, basically uh, which include, of course, obviously attack aircraft. They would use like fighters, uh, bombers, and of course, two torpedo bombers as as well. And um, their main target, of course, 
uh, was Hawaii. Oahu Island, of course, where the uh, Pacific Fleet, you know, was based uh, here. And um, the attack on Pearl Harbor, by the way, would occur on Sunday, December 7th, 1941. Uh, and you can see there, there basically are the two waves of attack planes that came in. One, of course, at about, they think, 7.55 a.m. Uh, of course, the other one, which is about maybe around 8.54 a.m. when they came in <clears throat> to attack them. Uh, their main target was not just the airfields. Of course, you can see there that they went after uh, in that map, but also uh, what they call Battleship Row, uh, which is like right here. Battleship Row, of course, was their main target, uh, which was basically the main capital ships that, you know, they wanted to go after, which at the time, you know, battleships was kind of seen as the main types of ships uh, that were important uh, in warfare. Uh, Battleship Row is located east of Ford Island. Uh, right there you can see, uh, which was also like an air base as well. And uh, you can see those are these are all the main uh, ships that they mostly kind of went after: uh, the USS Oklahoma, uh, the Maryland, the Utah, California, West Virginia, Tennessee, Nevada, and of course the USS Arizona. Those are all the ones. Of course, they went after some of the other ones. Of course, that were in also Pearl Harbor as well. They should have also targeted, but they did not. By the way, they did not target. By the way. Uh, the fuel air oil storage, which was over here, which they probably should have gone after as well. They would have destroyed that. That would have been a big mess, uh, but they did not. Uh, but uh, as you know, the Pearl Harbor attack, it damaged something like 18 ships were either damaged or destroyed. 24, 2,500 men uh, were actually killed in the attack, mostly sailors. Some civilians, I think, were killed uh, also as well from some of the bombings or stripe strafings uh, by the by the Japanese aircraft and um, it was total surprise by the way like we were we were caught down with our pants down uh, when this whole thing happened uh, and um, you know about the Japanese they sent sent back a coded message saying Tora 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 which meant tiger 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 <clears throat> and um and uh, a lot of Americans thought it was a drill. When they first saw it, seeing these, these Japanese planes coming in, they thought, oh, it's got to be a drill, something like that. Can't, can't must be somebody doing some bombing on Sunday, which is kind of a strange thing uh, to be kind of doing. And so they had to send out a message, by the way, to everybody to, to make sure everybody knew that this wasn't a drill. They said, this is no shit. This is no drill, I think is what they told them. Uh, and so... Um, Pearl Harbor ends up being a disaster. Pearl Harbor, if you know about it, was considered one of the worst naval disasters in American history. Like one of our worst defeats we ever suffered, uh, by the way. I believe that's Battleship Row, which is right here, kind of right there. Kind of, it's kind of a picture of kind of the whole thing, I guess, going on uh, right there. But the Arizona, of course, the most famous you know, ship uh, in the attack was totally destroyed. Uh, like 80% of the actual crew on the Arizona was killed, like almost not quite 12. I think it's 1,177, I think, was the total amount of men uh, that actually killed on it. That's why the USS Kidd is such a big deal, like in, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, because of why it's there, why they have it as a museum ship, because uh, you have to understand that the Arizona was the uh, flagship of the Rear Admiral Isaac Kidd. You know, he was, he was killed in the attack. You know, they never found him, like the remains of him. He was blown up. Uh, they think I think they found his ring or something, his his West like his Na Naval Academy ring. I think they found that, something like that. Uh, he was blown up, uh, and so that's that's why the kids named after him, uh, not really Captain Kid. So yeah, Arizona was blown up. Uh, also, the Oklahoma, uh, of course, there's the Arizona right there burning. It actually burned towards Christmas time. Uh, and, of course, later they would get rid of the top of it, as you know, and they would create the Arizona Memorial uh, that's there today. But they actually have uh, oil leaking out of it still on the actual uh, ship below. And people joke about today that that's the men crying, you know, as the oil's coming up, basically, the men that died 
there's a lot of ghosts down there. Um, there's the Oklahoma far right. It actually capsized, almost flipped over uh, right here. Uh, they actually had men trapped inside of it that couldn't get out. Uh, by the way, actually, you get guys with torches to get out and cut people out. And so, I mean, I think they did get out and some died inside, never could get out, of course. Uh, there was actually one ship called the USS Shaw. I think it was a destroyer or something like that. It actually blew up into a fireball, but it was it was actually in dry dock. Nobody was on it, I don't think. But it's kind of a famous explosion that's associated with it. So basically, because of that, you know, the United States uh, on December 8th declares war on Japan. If you know about FDR, uh, he becomes, Franklin D. Roosevelt becomes famous for one of his greatest speeches uh, that he ever gave. Uh, in Congress, which of course was the famous, you know, day of infamy speech, uh, in, which was like only like three or four minutes long uh, was the speech. And so uh, from there, we're basically propelled into the war uh, where the United States is now fighting, you know, uh, basically Japan. Uh, and then, of course, what happens because of that, the Germans come in, Italy comes in, they declare war on us as well. Uh, and so now, now we're in a two-front war. We're having to fight Japan, Germany, Italy, uh, all basically, you know, uh, at the same time. So that's basically, you know, how uh, the United States really gets in the war uh, at that point. Uh, and, um, yeah, there were some American planes that went up. And I think by the end of the, the actual battle of Pearl Harbor, if you want to call it that, we did shoot some of them down. Uh, by the way, uh, but I think we took more loss. I think a lot of our planes were actually on the ground. They got they got basically destroyed uh, by the Japanese. It was a rout, actually, that actual battle. I guess they do call it the Battle of Pearl Harbor, kind of. I think it's one name they dub it. But we'll get revenge later. You know, eventually, you know, we'll we'll retaliate against them, uh, as you know. But the Pacific War later. Uh, later in the war, like 1942, they had the Battle of Midway will eventually sink, I think, four of those carriers that were at Pearl Harbor, uh, by the way. And that'll, of course, turn the tide, of course, in the war. So uh, that's it for part one lecture, of course, on World War II. I think next week, next Tuesday, I'll, of course, have, you know, probably a little longer lecture I might have, uh, which will be from World War II from 1942 uh, to 1945. Part two is going to be talking about how 1942 is like the turning point year of World War II. You got a lot of turning point battles that are pretty important. Uh, Battle of El Alamein, uh, Battle of Stalingrad, uh, Battle of Midway. Uh, those, those battles kind of turn the tide, of course, in the war for the Allies. I'll talk about how the Allies invade. Uh, like They also uh, defeat uh, Hitler in North Africa. Uh, we also take, we take Italy, Sicily, Italy. Uh, also, we got the D-Day invasion uh, where they take back France. And then I'll get into the Pacific War, too, you know, about how we defeat uh, the uh, Japanese in the war. And, of course, we'll talk about the atomic bomb. That's one of those things that, of course, helped to shorten the war later, of course, against the Japanese. So that's it for today. Uh, if anybody else has any other questions about you know the lecture, you know, let me know uh, later on. You can, of course, send me any kind of comments you want of course, on my on my uh, YouTube channel. Uh, and um, so, yeah, reminder, don't forget, uh, you do have some new Canvas quiz that are up, of course. Yeah, no problem about that. Uh, but, um, yeah, don't forget about those Canvas quiz that are up, of course. Uh, you've got two of them. you got the one on, you know, the Industrial Revolution you got to finish up. And then, of course, the one on World War I you've got uh, next week uh, as well. And you've got that final vocab. So that's it for today. Uh, I, of course, will see y'all, of course, next week. Hope y'all have a great uh, weekend uh, coming up. And, of course, I will see y'all, of course, next week. Okay.